Hey listeners, before we get started, I wanted to share with you a brand new podcast that you might be interested in. It's the new Braves Dugout Podcast. This podcast is about all things Atlanta Braves baseball. They talk about roster moves, potential trades, game recaps. Now this may all seem cliche for a sports podcast, but they also include a special segment each week where they talk about controversial topics using only stats and logic and no bias. Controversial topics such as which Braves player should or should not be in the Hall of Fame, why your favorite player may not be as valuable as you think they are, or how certain players you may not like deserve more love. It's the new Braves Dugout Podcast. You can currently catch this podcast. See what I did there? Catch this podcast on Spotify or on Anchor.fm. It's sure to be a hit. Mmm, these taste great. You should come try one, Yogi. Hey, hey, Ranger, what do you got there? It's a brand new cookie by the makers of Double Stuffin'. Mmm, these are mighty delicious. Hey, Yogi, what is it that you're eating? Hey, Boo Boo, it's a brand new cookie. It's the first cookie made specifically for bears and their owners. It's called a cod cookie. You were not my owner, but give me another cookie. Okie dokie, Yogi. They're made from real fish. And they're also dairy free. It's safe even for pescatarian bear owners. The new God cookie. Strong enough for a bear, but made for a woman. Hey! Ladies and gentlemen! Welcome to the Above Average Show! Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Above Average Joe Show. I am your host, as always, Joe Nelson, and today my guest has worked on several, several, several projects. Uh, He started working as a production assistant and worked his way up to an assistant director and has worked on projects including Insurgent, Allegiant, Transcendent, The Nice Guy, Seven Psychopaths, We Bought a Zeus, Pirates of the Caribbean, On Stranger Tides, Drillbit Taylor, Live Free or Die Hard, Blades of Glory, The Santa Claus 3, Dodgeballs, The Thura, 40-Year-Old Virgin, War of the Worlds, Van Helsing, Starsky and Hutch, Terminator 3, Phone Booth, Tin Cup, The Lone Ranger, and I'm only listing the stuff that I recognize. (laughs) That were big name movies, because that was only about half to a third of the list. But our guest today is assistant director Kevin Roy. How are you doing, Kevin? Hey, Joe. Take a breath. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it surprises me sometimes when I hear all those credits, because I don't remember a lot of them. And then uh, and then you say, I'm like, oh, yeah, and then, like, m- memories just kind of like flood into my, my brain. But uh, yeah, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Trying to stay safe and healthy in this pandemic that we're in the middle of i know it's like i was supposed to be in maui doing a movie literally had my ticket and then the quarantine started and then everything got pushed and shut down i'm like no (laughs) maui yeah are they still hoping you go back to hawaii then or is it yeah we're, we're doing that in hawaii hopefully in july september whenever it opens up yeah it'll be it'll be nice hopefully it's still the summer when we get to go (laughs) <laughs> and so working on all of those projects, how did you get into the film industry? Um, oddly enough, I was I went to school in Texas, uh, Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. And um, I was actually a criminal justice major. Wow, that's quite a jump. <laughs> right? Well, I, I feel like I've always wanted to be in film, but as a kid growing up in Louisiana and then, you know, briefly in California for like two years and then, uh, which kind of like made me like, oh, the film world, it's right there. It's like, you know, just over the hill. And then I, then my family moved to Texas and I'm like, oh, there went that dream. <laughs> and then, uh, so when I got into to college, I didn't really know what else to do. And, and I loved like FBI type stories. I think my idea was to be in like, you know, something FBI, CIA, you know, living that dream. And then, uh, I, the guy across the hall was in the film program and I helped him out with like a couple short films that he did. And I'm like, I don't really want to be in the FBI or CA. I just want to make movies about it. <laughs> so uh, I switched majors, and, and that's kind of how I got in. But how I got into, like, working in Los Angeles, like, professionally into the film business, I actually left college. I got accepted to, like, a U- USC summer production workshop in, like, I'm old, so these dates for some of you kids, uh, 1996. <laughs> so I went 
to USC in, 19, in the summer of 1996. I met some people. They were like, hey, if you come back out here, we have a short film, you know, so you can live on my couch. So I left college and I went, I, I drove to California just with, you know, a backpack basically in my car. Um, and my sister lives in San Diego. So I lived on her couch and then just like worked on, you know, during the week, I would live on another friend's couch um, that crashed and burned and failed like horribly. <laughs> and, uh, and actually the, the actor, Bruce Campbell, do you know Bruce Campbell? Yeah, yeah. Cult, cult sensation Equal of Evil Dead. Dead. Yeah, and Army of Darkness. Um, I made weird friendship with him in college because I met him on the internet and I didn't believe that it was actually Bruce Campbell. And then he called me on the phone and was like, this is really Bruce Campbell. And I'm like, holy crap, you know? Um, so that was interesting. And then we kind of like had like an email back and forth. So when I went out to California, I'm like, hey, dude, give me a job on like Xena, not knowing that Xena and Hercules are shot in New Zealand because I was an idiot. <laughs> but uh, and he was just like, so he so he tracked me down somehow to my sister's apartment in uh, San Diego. And he called me again and he was like, what are you doing? Like, what? Tell me, what, what have you done? And I'm like, well, this is what I've done. He's like, OK, you've done nothing like student stuff. You want to <laughs> yeah. be like an assistant director, like, you know, nothing about unions like you know, that's you're not going to be an assistant director on, on anything uh, until you put in the time and learn and what you're doing because whatever. Because I, I was like an assistant director on one indie movie in in Houston that I didn't really know what I was doing. But um, so yeah, he kind of gave me like you know the truth. He was like the one person telling me like how it was and the truth and kind of what he went through. And then after that phone call, I kind of like you know packed up all my stuff and went back to college. <laughs> and then because I didn't have a plan, and that's basically what he was saying, like, you need a plan for this town. And then next time I came out, I had a plan. I got a job within a month and here I am. Wow. And, and then how did you make the transition from LA to Atlanta where I met you? Um, I was, when I joined the Directors Guild of America as an assistant director, um, you basically cannot work in the bubble, which is Los Angeles until you accumulate, you know, X amount of days. I think it's 400 days. So you have to work basically, you have to be a gypsy and work, you know, everywhere else. Like your local can't be Los Angeles. You can do like commercials and stuff in Los Angeles. Uh, and, and then there's like different tiers for like budget wise where you can work on stuff like lower budget. But I was like, well, I'm working on you know bigger movies and I have a network. So I lived in uh, New Mexico for a time and that's where I did Lone Ranger and Transcendence. And then, um, and then after that kind of dried up because, uh, New Mexico is very territorial, as was Georgia when I kind of went there, but New Mexico more so. And um, because I wasn't living in New Mexico, it was just kind of like, you know, I would just go there for work. I wasn't getting a lot of jobs. So I was like, all right, I'm from Louisiana, so I'm going to go to Louisiana because there's a lot of work there. And then my friend works for Google and lives out in Atlanta. So I'm like, well, I'm going to go visit him and then I'll just, I'll just see what the film world is like there. And then uh, that's how I got a job. Even though I was assistant director, sometimes you kind of have to like get that job as like a production assistant or a consultant or whatever on like another movie. And I did Fast and Furious 7 after the Paul Walker stuff. When they came back up, I, I jumped in there for like a couple months because I was, I was kind of ADing the fight coordination between Ben Diesel and Jason Statham in Los Angeles. Nice. So I went to Atlanta with that project to like film that fight sequence, which took like, I think two months or something like that because they went to Dubai in the middle of it and whatnot. So I kind of went with that. And when that was over, I met Christina who got me the job on uh, insurgent. And then I, I kind of like went home for like a spell, packed more stuff and then came out with my AD hat and started on insurgent. And that's where I met you. Yep, I was going to say, that's where we met, <laughs> yeah. was on the set of Insurgent at Amity. Yes. And that's yeah. when I first started getting into casting, too. So I okay. guess right when you moved to Atlanta was when I started in casting, moving up from working in background. Wow, I wouldn't have guessed it. Like, you seemed, like, so experienced on set. Like, you were, like, you know, one of my rocks to go to. So. <laughs> uh -huh. I guess I'm good at faking it. That's what yeah, that's yeah. what we do in the acting business. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that's what we do in the assistant director business. Too, so. <laughs> and Kevin, you work as an assistant. Well, you worked as a production assistant first, and then you worked up to assistant director. What does an assistant director do on set and off of set? When you graduate, I guess, from a production assistant, assistant director, you're kind of doing a lot of stuff that you were assisting with 
there's a lot of assisting in this world, <laughs> but uh, um, as a production assistant, but then you become kind of like the boss, you know, or the, the person who's, I guess, in charge and, and, you know, the buck stops with you. So as an assistant director, you're kind of like the manager on set. So um, we deal with the scheduling uh, of the, the shooting schedule, the actor schedule, um, when, you know, different items are going to be needed. So we basically coordinate with all the department heads to be like, okay, we're going to need this costume on this day and we're going to need this prop on this day. So there's a lot of managerial parts to it. We're also kind of watching the budget the whole time to make sure we're not spending money that we don't need. You know, we have to make like a lot of money decisions about, okay, this isn't working. So now we have to go here and do this. But we're basically, yeah, like I said, managers on set, to put it in simplistic terms, where everybody gives us what they have, and then we kind of coordinate and schedule when to use it, what's the most efficient and cost-effective way to, to shoot the movie and schedule the movie. And then there's also a position just under that, which is the second AD. Um, <laughs> what is the difference between an AD, a second AD, and when do they decide, hey, let's bring in a second AD, or even when do we bring in a second second AD? <laughs> right? and what, what do they do, and how does that all coordinate together? <laughs> yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of twos in the American uh, film business. So the first assistant director, like I said before, is kind of like, you know, he makes the plan or he or she makes the plan uh, that kind of, you know, schedules the movie and like, this is what we're going to do every day. So then once that plan's in effect, it's handed down to the second assistant director. And the second assistant director is the guy or girl who sits in the trailer a lot of times and makes a lot of phone calls or is the person running around set that you can't ever talk to because they're looking at like tomorrow, the next day, next week, what actors do we have to fly in? What piece of equipment do I need to coordinate with? you know, the grips or electric or the office or costumes or whatever. So it's here when we shoot it. And it's not like, you know, in Timbuktu somewhere, like on the day that we shoot it. So that's the second sister's second assistant director's job is basically to make sure that the assistant director, the first assistant director's uh, plan is going to happen. And we're not going to be waiting for anything. Uh, the actors are going to know when they're working and whatnot. The second, second assistant director who's also in, in the American, in the Directors Guild of America, um, we're all classified as second assistant directors. So when you call in a second one, that's basically to assist, you know, if you have like big background days that, uh, you know, like on Amity, like in Amity, on uh, Insurgent and Allegiant, when you have these big days, the second AD can't really, you know, there's, it's hard for him to, to, to plan all this, this stuff in the future and then deal with the day to day. So you bring in like somebody to basically assist with that. So the, um, so I would come in like, you know, I would help the second AD on insurgent and basically coordinate all the background stuff, talk to you and Jamie and make sure that, you know, all of the, uh, this is the list that we need, you know, that came from the top. They want to cut this many people or add this many people last <laughs> minute, which happens. Uh, I apologize more often you know. than you'd think. <laughs> yeah. More often Unless you, you worked in like, casting. <laughs> right. And, and you guys are like the heroes because it's like, okay, we need a hundred new people for tomorrow. Go. You have like, you know, 12 hours before call. Or people like that aren't scheduled, hours. people we haven't seen. <laughs> yeah. Haven't been fitted. Go. Do it. But uh, yeah, so that's usually what the second, second assistant director does. And then you also have like additional second assistant directors. And basically at that point, it's just help. And let's go ahead and jump into We Bought a Zoo. So literally all we did was like shoot animals doing animal things. Every once in a while we would get somebody from the cast to like come over for whatever. Like we had Matt Damon one day and, and uh, who's a really awesome dude. Um, and we put like thousands of bees all over him. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he, he, I remember like I was in the golf cart like driving him back to base camp afterwards. And he was just saying, like, he was talking, you know, like when you have headphones in and you're like talking really loud. So he was talking like elevated and everyone was like, you know, you're talking really loud. And he was like, oh, because all he could hear was like the bees, like swarming. Oh. Even though they were off of him, like that buzzing, yeah. constant buzzing was just like it reverberated so much. That's all he could hear. So he was saying everything like really, really <laughs> high. And uh, yeah, 
But, Did you have um, to take no. precautions on set for bees then? Is everybody in bee suits while they're filming? Uh, or? Not everybody. I mean, um, we bought a zoo. I, I've done a, a couple of animal movies, like Garfield 2, The Tale of Two Kitties. We had a ton of animals on Garfield's that as well. Garfield's animated. <laughs> yeah. Garfield's animated, but all of the other animals in the in the show, uh, even Odie, were, were all real animals. But And that one was different. I mean, I guess they're all a little bit different. Like in Garfield, we had we had a lot of predatory animals, like the birds will attack the rabbits and stuff like that. So you had to shoot a lot of things with the rabbits and then take the rabbits out and put the hawks in and do a pass with the hawks and take the hawks out and put, you know, this in. And, you know, you would sit there all day doing like, you know, for hours of just doing the same thing. And you have like a camera that's basically like a, you know, kind of, I want to say motion capture, but that's not the right word, but it's a... Uh, it basically just does the same motion over and over, and then you put all these animals in, and then when you layer, you blend all the layers, you have a scene that has all the animals in. Well, when we bought a zoo, we did a lot of isolation animals. The most interesting time was two weeks we worked with grizzly bears, oh, which wow. are like trained bears. This <laughs> this family from like bear country they're they're kind of the family that had like bart bart the bear and bart to the bear uh we had bart and uh one of the ancestors of bart and uh and this other bear called tank and one of them was a 1200 pound grizzly and one of them was a 900 pound grizzly so we're like okay as assistant directors like what precautions do we need for the crew and they're like oh we, you know here's like the crew can't you know you basically lock down the crew and they and i'm like okay what do we lock them down in and they're like, well, we have this little thin wire that we put around the crew. It's like, it looks like an electric wire, right? So, you know, we, we don't, animal cruelty and whatnot, we can't put electricity through that because it's danger for the crew and it's danger for the animals. And they're like, oh, don't worry, there's there's no electricity that are going to be through it. And I'm like, well, then what's the point of it? He goes, oh, well, we train the animals that when we train them, you know, we have like a low current or whatever, so they know that it's bad to touch it. So they think that there's electricity in it. So okay. I'm like, okay, so the animals think that they'll get shocked, but they actually won't get shocked, but they stay away from these. Like I, like I saw an animal kind of, um, it was coming off of a, a platform and it got really close to the fence. It didn't touch the fence, but it like started freaking out because it was so close to the front, the fence. And then the, the animal trainers have to like come in and like calm down the animals. But that, yeah, it was a really interesting you know, you lock down the crew so the crew can't walk in when you have grizzly bears, like, roaming around. So they do something similar with elephants, too, for, well, the circus that used to have elephants, right. that they would train them to just stay by the stake so they could put a stake without a rope tied to them eventually because right. they would think, hey, if there's a stake there, I can't go more than three feet away. So they would just stay by the stake with no rope tied to their leg. That's so interesting. Yeah. And then you see like dogs and dogs are like, <laughs> could be tied to a stake and is still trying to like, pull. <laughs> never learns. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was interesting. We work with grizzly bears, um, ostriches, monkeys, baboons. It's funny. Cause like, um, on, we bought a zoo, we had tigers, grizzly bears, you know, all these lions, all these dangerous animals. And the one that was the the most that we would lock down and the most safe that we would be were the baboons, because baboons will come at you and nobody can stop. Oh yeah, them. no, so, those things are brutal. Yeah, so like you couldn't look at the baboons. Like if you know, it would literally like we would get all the crew and they would push them as far. Like they would have to hide, and then the trainers would have to walk the baboons in with like this little leash around its neck, you know, and and they just walk, you know, on on two feet and they walk in. And then, um, and then they put them in the cage or wherever they're going to put them, and then the crew can come back in and work. But, yeah, you can't look at them or anything because if they sense, like, a threat, they'll just come at you. Oh, wow. And so then speaking of all the animals you've worked with, um, you've also worked with pirates. I have worked with pirates, <laughs> lots and lots of pirates. They are a, uh, a very piratey bunch. But, yeah, we had, we had fun. That, that was probably one of the – you know, speaking of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, it was Pirates 4 on Stranger yeah. Tides. And it was probably one of the hardest movies that I've ever worked on for me in what, you know, running base camp and uh, running the actors and so many cast and being on location. Um, but yeah, that was definitely one of the hardest movies I think I've ever worked on. And you said you had a story about Jeffrey Rush earlier when we were talking. <laughs> so... You tell me that, you know, one of your favorite movies, Blades of Glory, Talladega Nights. I was 
the first day I met Jeffrey Rush, everybody always makes like on every movie. It, it feels like it, this always happens on every movie where they may always make a big deal about one of the main actors because you know they're everyone's walking on eggshells and like, oh, don't say this and don't upset them and don't do this. And I've never once been in that situation where it turned out where the actor was a jerk. Always the actor is like the cool, laid back, like downer. I feel like it's all the agents and people that that you know you have to deal with like with the those are the difficult people and they always make the actors seem like they're going to be more difficult than they actually are so i had that in my head with jeffrey rush i i met him you know we were in uh Kauai shooting and i met him and i showed him to his room and everyone was like he's gonna hate the room and he's gonna complain and switch like three times he loved the room everything <laughs> was fine so you know I, so we left him in the room and we, i walked away and the hotel we were staying at with the marriott was like a massive hotel and then i was kind of wa- wandering around like you know checking on different things and i saw jeffrey rush just wandering around the hotel lost obviously lost and i'm like in my head i'm like oh man like should I say something? Should I just let him wander around? Like, you know, what, what do I do? I decided to say something. So I'm like, Hey, Jeffrey, you know, I'm Kevin. I, I met you like a little, like an hour ago. Are you, are you lost? Can I help you find something? He's like, yeah, I need to buy a lighter. So I'm like, okay. You know, he's got candles or whatever. He's got to buy a lighter. So I'm like, there's a gift shop over here. Let me walk with you. The gift shop was probably like a 10 minute walk. So me and Jeffrey Rush, I'm like, what do you talk to with Jeffrey Rush? Like, <laughs> you're winning, you know, Jeffrey Rush, like, you know, theatrical, like, thespian, like, Shakespearean <laughs> actor, Jeffrey Rush. Like, what do you talk, what do I talk about with Jeffrey Rush? So, making small talk, I mentioned the assistant director, uh, this guy, Peter Cohen, who was kind of like my mentor, you know, assistant directing and whatnot. I was talking about him because I know he, I knew he did all the other pirate movies and he had worked with Jeffrey Rush before. And, uh, and he's like, oh, yeah, how do you know Peter? And I'm like, well, I, I met him when I worked on a movie, Blades of Glory. And he's like, oh, my God, Blades of Glory is like <laughs> one of the best comedies ever. And I'm like, wait, Jeffrey Rush loves <laughs> Blades of Glory? We instantly had something to talk about. So I'm like, yeah. He goes, he goes I think Will Ferrell is like one of the comedy genius. And Talladega Nights is like one of the, my top five comedy movies like ever. And I'm like, are you, are you serious? So like long story short, me and Jeffrey Rush walked for 10 minutes doing the baby Jesus dinner table scene, <laughs> like verbatim, like me and Jeffrey Rush are just like doing the baby Jesus scene, like back and forth. It was like the best, I, I left, when I left him at the gift shop and you know, he said he knew his way back, I had like the biggest smile on my face. I'm like, this is, this is going to be a great movie. Like Jeffrey Rush is awesome. So <laughs> that is great. <laughs> This episode brought to you by Bees. Bees, the makers of honey, bringing you nothing but the sweetest nectar of life. Unless, of course, you're Macaulay Culkin and my girl. Back to the show. You also worked on another favorite movie of mine, Dodgeball. <laughs> which I feel like that would have been a very difficult shoot to not hurt somebody with all these balls flying around. I can imagine. um, I actually worked on the reshoots to Dodgeball, so it was only like a day or two. Uh, We did a lot of, it was primarily Dodgeball scenes, so I can talk to like that, you know. I was a production assistant. It was like earlier in my career. It was a lot of fun because I was like, Dodgeball? Like, this sounds like an amazing movie. we did do a lot of the dodgeball stuff, like the the final competition. I think we reshot the ending um, to make it better, and we did all the stuff with Ben Stiller in like the fat suit at the in the, the credits or whatever. We shot all that stuff as well. <laughs> yeah, um, I really didn't have like my hand in in a lot of the stunts on that. I was kind of like a, a set guy that was just telling people to be quiet uh, back in those days. They use real dodgeballs, and I don't remember any stunt doubles. To be honest with you, I remember just the actors like you know, tossing, tossing the balls at it one <laughs> another. So, um, I had questions. I don't know. This may or may not even get into it. Um, I had questions about Zathura also because it's the sequel to Jumanji. So I'm, I'm curious on like, what did you do on Zathura? Cause most people have not even seen or watched it, not even realized that there was a sequel to Jumanji other than the new Jumanjis that came out. <laughs> 
Right, and Zathura is an amazing movie. It's a uh, John Favreau before Iron Man, really, right after Elf, because I know he was giving away Elf as a rap gift to everybody. So he had just like had the success of Elf, and then he did Zathura. Um, and Lula Kristen Stewart before she hit it yeah, big. Before Twilight, um, it's funny. I think I only worked with Kristen Stewart like one day. But we had in the movie, her character is she plays like the older sister and she gets frozen. So we had this like, you know, gentle giant came in and made like this, this, you know, life size frozen statue of Kristen Stewart. So like, I feel like I've worked with her for a long time because <laughs> I saw that thing every day, but I only actually worked with the, the actress like one day. So did um, you have to call in like, Hey, can we bring in Kristen Stewart? And they just roll in this statue. Yeah, pretty much because <laughs> she was frozen for like a lot, a big part of the movie. And, uh, Dax Shepard was in the movie. Uh, oh, that's it's right. an amazing movie. Yeah. Like, it's such a good movie. Louis, um, the producer was Louis Desposito, who, who is the producer of all the Marvel movies now. Like him and John Favreau did that, and then he went to Iron Man, and then, that, then it's like that's what you know he does now. Louis does, but uh, yeah, that and Peter Billingsley, who was like the kid oh, from uh, Christmas Story. Yeah, yeah he was a producer because he's like good friends with John Favreau. He's, he's one of his producers, so he was a producer on it. So we talked a lot about a Christmas Story. He said that. You know, he gets a, a leg lamp every birthday, Christmas. <laughs> he said he has a closet full of them. He's sick of getting them. Please stop sending him leg lamps. But uh, no, really nice guy. But yeah, Zerthoro is a great movie. Um, it was a movie that almost ended my career. Oh, wow. <laughs> I say that with uh, kind of joking because it was, it was, okay, you're on a sound stage. You have 5 a.m. calls. So I'm like already tired. You're in space the entire time. It's freezing cold, and you're literally like – we were doing uh, safety lockups because I was a PA on it, and we had the whole house on a gimbal, which is like a big device that kind of rocks you know, the house. So we got hired to you – know, several PAs got hired to stand around the gimbal and make sure that you know, when the gimbal gets activated, nobody's under the gimbal and you know, everyone's at a safe different distance away. Well, I think the second day of shooting with the gimbal, John Favreau is like, I hate the gimbal. It's ruining the camera shots. We're never using the gimbal again. But us, we were all hired as PAs, so we just basically stood around doing sound lockups. So we didn't even have, like, the safety aspect for the most part. So we were just standing in the dark. You have, like, a 360-degree star background around because, you know, if, if they see out the window, they need to see stars because the house is in space. So, So you're basically, like – sleeping standing up the entire time <laughs> so i felt like nobody was gonna hire me again because i couldn't stay awake on that movie and then i got like i moved over to second unit and then like i came in with a second unit guy and then i was like i just felt brain dead and uh, i ended up le leaving that movie uh like a couple weeks before it was over uh because i got hired on that movie domino with tony scott which was amazing and and oh, yeah. uh john wildermuth who who was the first ad on insurgent and allegiant that's where I met him on Domino. So I kind of, yeah, that's how, that's how that works. I just, I just figured that out in my head. So, yeah. <laughs> and then you've also got a couple of projects that are coming up that you've just recently worked on. Um, you've got one, The Devil Makes Three, and also Lena and Snowball. Tell us a little bit about those before we wrap things up. Well, um, Devil Makes Three, uh, um, a buddy of mine who we became really good friends through the process of this named Stu Silverman. Um, he did a Kickstarter and whatnot. Well, sorry, the first one, it, it's basically an anthology horror movie. So he's shooting three movies and putting them together as one or three short films and putting them together as one feature film. Um, Stu is like a student of horror movies. He knows like every, everything about horror movies, like how to, the stylistic approach and the music. And he's so like, so like particular about everything. So he, the first one that we did was a, a short called bug, um, about a, a lady kind of, you know, going crazy kind of in her own mind and things around her environment that are kind of like pushing her over the edge without giving away too much. Um, we shot that one out of his pocket you know, he paid for it all. And then after that, he did a Kickstarter campaign and he ended up raising like a lot of money to do the, the next two, uh, which we shot the second one as well. It's a really, um, I think the, the hashtag is the devil makes, you know, hashtag the devil makes three or the devil makes three.com. Um, 
check that out because it's upcoming. We have one more to shoot before we're finished with it, but that's going to be amazing. We have amazing composers coming on to it and, you know, cinematographer just shot these things. It's just, I can't say so much. Like I've seen bug and it's so good. And my <laughs> girlfriend watched it with me and she knew nothing about it. She was like, this is intense. So, um, so yeah, I, I feel like when, when these do come out, it's going to be huge for Stu. Um, and the, the horror genre in general. Um, and then the other one is on the, the direct opposite. <laughs> Lena and Snowball. Is, uh, we actually shot it in Georgia. Um, I think it was last December. We sh- or two Decembers ago, I guess, that we, we shot it. Um, a good friend of mine who I've known for 20 years named Brian Herzlinger directed it. Um, I, I've never worked with Brian before. We've been friends for 20 years. He, he oh, went wow. directing and I went assistant directing. We've never worked with the, with each other. And then kind of like the fates aligned where I was at home in Texas for Thanksgiving and he called me up. He's like, Hey, we're doing this in like a couple of weeks. We need, or like a week, we need a, uh, an assistant director because whatever fell through. And I'm like, yep. Borrowed my mom's car and like drove to Georgia <laughs> and we shot the movie in like 10 days. It's about a girl who's kind of a loner. She's moved to this new town. She doesn't have any friends. Uh, and then she ends up finding a white lion cub named Snowball in the for in the swamp forest area, and then she befriends it. But there's these two guys uh, who are who are coming after her because they they're basically poachers, and they're uh, they lost the lion. So it's kind of a slapstick kids movie, family movie, comedy uh, with a good heart uh, movie. And that one's coming out soon on on the streaming and straight to video and all that business so uh, awesome. look for that one yeah cool i'm excited to watch both of those they yeah it's interesting and exciting in like you said totally polar opposite totally ways polar. <laughs> totally the polar opposite yeah lena snowball i think it's it's gonna be a really good movie they sent me a cut of it but i haven't watched it because i kind of want to see it finished because i don't want to just you know, sometimes we pollute pollute ourselves in uh in this business with with watching things before it's done and then you kind of like you become oversaturated but yeah no i think it's gonna be a fun little family movie look for it and did you have any funny stories from 40 year old virgin oh my god that movie was like it was a difficult another difficult movie to work on because judd apatow um shoots like we shot it on film which was amazing like, back in the days when we shot on film but um, he would do like 10 minute takes. So he would load like a thousand foot magazine and he would just shoot it out, which is like crazy. Like I worked on uh, Lemony Snicket's, the movie of Lemony Snicket's, uh, and we shot more film in three months on 40 Year Old Virgin than we shot in nine months on Lemony Snicket's a oh, series wow. of unfortunate events. That's because there were so many jokes and these guys would just ad lib, you know, Steve Krell, uh, Romney Malco. Uh, Seth Rogen, Paul Rudd, all good dudes. And they would just sit there and just like riff. Uh, what's her name? Elizabeth uh, Banks was in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like everyone would just sit there and riff and just go for like 10 minutes. And we would kind of laugh on set, but it was kind of a, it was, it was one of those jury sets actually. I think everyone, I don't know what it was. It was, just, there was a weird funk around set and everyone was like, this movie is going to be the worst movie ever. <laughs> like it's going to be funny nobody's gonna get it um i think it was all because like after the, they shot the first day or two and then it the production like the studio shut the film down and was like you know we need to do something with steve carell's look because he kind of looks like you know a psycho like a serial killer or something <laughs> like that like it seems weird like we need to fix something we need to make him look you know, ha- you know like funner so they came in and they revamped his image and then we reshot a lot of the stuff that they shot the first days. And that's when I came into the movie, um, as a production assistant. And, um, yeah, it's like, we had a lot of laughs on the set, just, just amongst the assistant director team and the actors were great. The studio or the production, like, I guess it was one of those where they didn't have, they used all the budget probably on film. So we didn't have a, a, a rap party, or there was no planned rap party, which is like a huge, like, you know, the crew always wants a rap party because it's like the last farewell and you can see everybody in like not work terms, you know, and like hang out. And um, our second AD, this guy named Rusty Mahmood, who actually went on to be the first AD on The Office, he just put together a rap party and then Steve Carell and Paul Rudd like showed up and I think paid for the rap party 
like those guys like they you know it was just kind of like they heard the crew was showing up at a rap party you know and it was like anybody was invited and those guys like actually took the time out of their schedules to show up and I, yeah it, it was it would it meant a lot to the crew and uh, yeah and I, and I i've run into like steve Krell or I, after that and, and like the uh in like stores and stuff like that and he's just like one of the nicest stand-up guys him and paul rudd and will ferrell i think are the the three and seth rogan also like he'll remember who you are like after not seeing you for like 10 years and stuff like that those are all really good stand-up guys and uh you know wow. make everything fun to work with yeah steve carell i've i worked with him on anchorman too and i've heard just hundreds of stories from other people too that he's just probably the epitome of what you look for in an actor as far as a personable experience oh, that he's just a stand-up really guy he's very professional he comes in he knows what he's doing he does it great always on time he's just a loving giving person and no matter who you are he respects you which you don't necessarily always get from actors when they're on set yeah which is which is a huge huge plus for an assistant director because it's kind of like, you know, you are in charge of the actors and I've been in the position a lot where I'm like the guy they talk to, you know, I run base camp and I talk to the actors about their schedules and stuff. And if you get like, which I wouldn't say there's only been like one or two, which I won't mention in my career that have been like a nightmare or just not fun to work with, but everyone else has been awesome. I've worked with Russell Crowe twice and he's been great. Uh, and that's saying a lot. So I, I feel like, you know, people's perception of you know stories they hear or whatever i always say you know work with somebody like don't snap to or make snap judgments like work with somebody and find out like what they're about um uh, before you make you jump to conclusions because i've worked with so many people who had like bruce willis i've worked with had a great experience with him and he's like notoriously one of the worst people to ever work with but i yeah i had a really good experience with him with bruce willis uh two times i've worked with him actually um, like you said on the Die Hard movie that I did, uh, and then I worked on a commercial with him, which, yeah, it was great. Yeah, and I think a lot of people that make these snap judgments work with them for one day, and yeah. maybe that one day they had an off day or something, or maybe they found out they weren't getting a Christmas bonus or something, right. and so it's like, eh, not yeah. as fun of a day, but... Yeah, it's that, like I've been... You never on... know. Everybody has a bad day once in a while. Right. Or it's, you know, not even if that person's at the, yeah, it, it, it is to blame for the bad day, but I've been in the situation where like we did 49 takes on, on one scene and everyone was just like, oh my God, like move on. And then because of that, they decide that the actor's just like a bad person because they're trying to get their craft right. And I'm like, you know, it's, we got all the lights and, and extras look great and everything looks right. Like let the actor have the time to get their performance right and the director the time to work with them. Because, um, you know, it's just like, in the end, that's kind of what puts food on our tables, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you again, Kevin, for hanging out with us. Yeah. Thank you, listeners, for joining us for another episode. And we will be back next week with another great episode of the Above Average Joe Show. Thanks, Joe. Thank you again to our special guest, Kevin Roy. Be sure to check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitters, and look us up on Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. You can also check out another podcast I co-host, The Extra Unordinary, and some other great media content by Moon Possum Productions at moonpossum.com.